What's up, gangsters? How about some minutes of random? Okay, so here we go. Uh, kind of catching up with the Ming 148 scale Super Hornet that I've been working on uh, now for almost exactly two months. I started this thing on October the 1st, right at, and uh, I was giving myself three months to finish it, and I've used up <laughs> right at exactly two of those months to get to this point. <laughs> this thing, uh, it, you know, it overall is a is a pretty good kit. I would not say that it's caused me any undue drama. I've caused myself some undue drama, uh, which I'll explain in a second. But overall, I, I think this kit's pretty good. I mean, I give it like, an, I'm kind of at the 85 out of 100 point on the scoreboard. Um, the engineering is really good. The surface detail is outstanding. And for the most part, the fit is is pretty good. There's a couple of places that I'll talk about where the fit is a little bit problematic. Um, I mean, if you're super picky. I think the reality of this kit is, is that you could build the whole thing straight out of the box, not even use any filler, um, and you'd, you know, you know, if you did a good job of painting it, you'd come up with a pretty good looking model. But if you are really serious about taking care of things like joints and panel lines, it's gonna cause you some work, uh, more work than something that's just a little bit more refined, like a Tamiya kit, uh, probably would cause you. Um, they're just not quite there yet, and I'll talk about some of the some of the places where where it is. But yeah, I mean, I, it's taken me, like I said, two months of working what is probably an average of an hour a day uh, to get to this point. So I better get busy on the painting if I'm going to finish by December 31st. And I may not, I don't know. But to some of the specific issues I talked about before, uh, you know, with the bonus panel lines and, and uh, some of that stuff. So the thing that I've been working on, yep, still got flies. The thing that I've been working on recently is getting the cockpit all done. And that, yeah, that was self-inflicted uh, gunshot wounds because I was going to do the thing straight out of the box, and then I took a look at the kit decal, or kit details again, and the fact that it doesn't include any seat belts, and I was like, well, yeah, might as well just use some uh, Edward pre-painted photo etch, because it'll be quicker, right? <laughs> yeah, not so much. Um, it all turned out okay, but I had some challenges. That pre-painted photo etch uh, is nickel-plated brass, and I discovered that it does not like super glue as well as as just uncoated brass and i had some problems getting some of these pieces to stay stuck partly because i had neglected to do the basic step that you should always do with that stuff which is scuff the back of it with a, like a 400 grit sanding sponge to make sure that the super glue can do its job um, but i got through that one thing i also did that i think improves the look is i gave all of it a coat of uh, MRP super clear matte lacquer uh, because it, as it comes it's kind of a almost a semi gloss and it has a sort of a nubbly texture and that looks worse when light is bouncing off all of the little bumps and I think flattening it really makes a big difference and especially given that this thing is going to be hidden under a closed canopy I you know not not super worried about uh, like the instrument faces having a glossy finish. So I think that all came out pretty good. One thing that I ended up, uh, a decision I ended up having to make on the fly is to include a pilot. Um, here's the ejector seat. Uh, I'll talk about the pilot here in a second. Anyway, here's the ejector seat. Not, you know, not bad. One thing obviously I decided to do that's not out of the box is I added some uh, belts there to the top of it using some uh, Izu tape because uh, I just I mean I just couldn't not do that they show up you know so much right there at the top of the seat that I really felt like I had to do that because it's you know that's it's not going to get covered up by the pilot um, which is Lieutenant Commander John T. Rudder <laughs> And I uh, spent quite a bit of time on him, and he came out okay. Not not great, but the truth is, he's not molded in a super crisp fashion. He's, uh, yeah, his call sign uh, is the blob, because, 
yeah, he just, I mean, let's just face it. There's only so much you can do with that. Um, I, if I was, if I were going to take more time with this, um, I would have bought reed oak figures, which are 3D printed resin. And they're just amazing because he scans real people and shrinks them down. But I didn't want to wait for who knew how long to get those over from France. Uh, but anyway, the reason that I even have the pilot is um, I bought seat belts um, and I bought these swanky um, fine scale or fine molds uh, seat belts that are molded in polystyrene that uh, my buddy Justin Lentz showed me that are super, super cool. And I really wanted to use them, but <laughs> here's the reason that's not happening is because I made a, I made a, a, a large error. I was going to just go with the flaps up, not extended, because I just felt like that was more straightforward. Um, with the flaps down, um, it uh, obscures part of the fuselage right underneath there, and that was going to be in my way for painting. I just felt like flaps up was more straightforward, so I just barreled right through and did everything with flaps up. <laughs> well, as it happens, I started looking at my reference photos and I realized that, yeah, pretty much any time a Hornet is on the ground, the flaps are extended. And some discussion in SMCG with guys who actually flew and worked on these things confirms that pretty much that's gonna happen. The last thing the pilot does and when he gets out is drop the flaps and no hydraulic pressure, they're gonna go, they're down. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, the only the only option was to put a driver in it and, uh, you know, just depict it as, you know, he's on board, engines are running, he's getting ready to do something cool, so he's got the flaps up to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. So, yeah, there's that. Anyway, um, the other part that's been uh, a little bit challenging that people have run into is this section right here at the nose. Um, you can see that there's a joint uh, that runs right along there and goes up over the top of the fuselage and there is not supposed to be a panel line there. It's pretty much unavoidable. I mean, the, you know, that section is what glues to the front end of the fuselage. And, it, you know, I think the engineering is okay there. I'm honestly not sure how else they could have done it. I know with Tamiya's F-14, they managed to make that whole nose as a, uh, as a hollow piece that just inserts from the end, if I remember correctly. But I don't know how they could have done that here. So you kind of have to deal with this. And it is a bit of a challenge because you've got a panel line right there that crosses that joint. And there were a couple of little diamond-shaped protrusions right here by my thumbnail that were about a millimeter away from said joint that you're almost guaranteed to obliterate when you uh, deal with the joint. So, uh, yeah, what to do? So first things first was, um, is to, to uh, I looked at the thing in dry fit and the gap right here was about half a millimeter, 20 thousandths of an inch. And this panel line here by my thumbnail did not line up very well. And so some diagnosis told me that the issue was that the dimension from here to here was just slightly long. And there's some tabs under there uh, as well that, you know, get all that stuff uh, aligned. And so, I mean, it was a pretty easy diagnosis. And the fix was to very carefully, which was difficult, uh, sand the back end of this piece right here um, and take a little bit of material off of those tabs until it would actually go far enough uh, in there that it closed this gap and lined up these panel lines. And so, you know, that's, I mean, look, it's, that, I'm not going to say that was easy uh, because sanding the end of this thing off to where it stayed square and true and everything was was a bit of a challenge. I used a Goodman sanding block, which is just um, sandpaper glued to a, a, a plexiglass chunk. So I had a nice flat surface to work with, but it was still a challenge. Um, but no matter what, you're going to have a gap or, or a joint to deal with right here. And that's you know going to involve some challenges. So once I had that all squared away and glued up, one thing that I did was I went ahead and, and made sure and scribed this line, uh, made sure that all of these panel lines that are in this area 
were um, deep enough that any sanding that I did would not screw them up. And I think I did okay with that. Then I taped everything off, protected it, uh, used sprue goo to fill in wherever I actually had a gap. In some places, the joint just essentially disappeared. It wasn't much of a big deal. But from, from here around to the other side, I had uh, a bit of a joint showing. And right here, you can see uh, that, that I have some sprue goo in the corner there. And that's because there was a bit of a step that I had to level out. So, um, you know, it was a bit tricky to make sure that the panel lines did not get obliterated. But as you can see, those little diamond shaped things that were right there, they did get obliterated. And here's why. Because what those are is they're RAM patches, radar absorbent material patches. And they are uh, like, uh, like here's an example. That one right there by my thumbnail is essentially what they what they look like. And what they are is anywhere there's a perforation in the fuselage, they uh, put those patches on there to reduce the radar cross-section. And they are actually not included in several other places where they are common on a Super Hornet. But the good news is, is that on every photo I have of Super Hornets, they're not there. They don't exist. They are there on Legacy Hornets. And I was told that what that is is the drain for the windshield de-icing system. So, hey, not there. <laughs> that decision was easy. Just go ahead and obliterate them, get them out of there. All right, the next place that I found a bit of a gap that was a challenge is back here on the stabilizers. Um, they fit pretty good. They were a bit tight. There's a big tab that goes in to the fuselage, and I like the engineering because it's pretty solid, but it's a very tight fit, so I had to loosen the tab a little bit. And then even once I got it in there and got that joint uh, you know, tight, there was a, a pretty substantial gap uh, on the inside, and you can see it right there. And it is just literally a gap, and that was unacceptable. So what I did is what I call the wet dressing method or the wet sanding method, wet removal method, chemical sanding, whatever you want to call it, where I filled the gap with my favorite black super glue, which is the Starbond stuff I've been using, and then come back and use uh, some of this uh, Pro CA Debonder um, as, uh, as my chemical sanding uh, uh, medium, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, I'll show you how quick and easy that is. I feel like that this uh, black CA, maybe because of the uh, rubberizing uh, compounds that they put in it to make it a little softer, also makes it where it removes more easily. And it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So what I do, I mean, you can see, hopefully you'll be able to see, I've got some excess right in there in that part of the joint. So I get some on a, on a pointy Q-tip, and a Q-tip needs to be pretty wet. And then just get in there and start rubbing, and you can see how quickly it comes off. And it's gonna take off any paint, primer, whatever, as well, but it, but it does not harm the plastic. Now, not all of these debonders are created equal. Some of them don't work as well. Some of them will harm the plastic. So you have to be careful of that. The VMS stuff that Uncle Night Shift has been using and, and he you know gave those guys some advice on, on developing it uh, apparently is, is pretty good. So you just have to you know get a brand that, that works and that may require uh, some experimentation. But it's a good technique. Now, what you'll find, though, is that after you do this, and I don't think you'll be able to see this on camera, that uh, for whatever reason, this little this, this black CA will have some uh, little pinholes and imperfections in it that'll show up under primer. So what I've started doing is taking a brush like this, getting some of that debonder on there, and just making a couple of passes along there like that just enough to soften the surface and kind of let me smooth it over. And it works, seems to work pretty good. We'll see when I put some primer on there. But at any rate, that is what's been going on with the Superbug, which has been, uh, yeah, uh, 
a lot more of uh, a project than I anticipated, but I think it's going to be good. If I can just get to paint where it turns into full-on fun, I'll be happy. I've also been doing some other things. Here's some 3D printing uh, results that I've got. This is part of my kit design project that I'm doing for Fantastic Plastic. This is for the X24B, uh, some uh, cockpit details, an instrument panel, some side console action, hopefully I can get this to show up. Uh, this gray, you know, gray resin is not the best for seeing these details, but I haven't had a chance to put any black primer on this. But the smallest of those details, like the little switch guards there, those are 0.1 millimeters uh, thick. And they printed really well on my Epax X1 4K 5.5 mono. So I'm happy about that, because um, that's kind of given me an idea of what sort of details I can get. I've got all those little toggle switches sticking out there. Those are 0.2 millimeter diameter by about a half millimeter tall, and they seem to be doing okay. Now, a lot of it just comes down to print orientation. This stuff is all printed in Craftsman Gray at 10 microns, so I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, something else that I've continued to tinker with is uh, this foil project. And I found a thing. It's crazy how sometimes this stuff happens on the internet. Um, I discovered uh, an Instagram post by this guy. I'll show you here on Instagram. This guy, uh, whose name I'm sure I will completely butcher, Toshiaki Yoshimoto. He does fantastically cool bare metal projects like that. I mean, look at that. It looks pretty amazing, right? Way too shiny for what I want to do. That works for a fully restored and polished Warbird, but not for a fresh out of the factory thing. But here's what was compelling, is that he's getting this Hasegawa mirror finish film to conform to stuff like that. And I, and I haven't totally deciphered how. Um, but I wanted, anyway, I wanted to try it, so I bought some. Uh, they have, uh, you know, several different types of, uh, of the stuff. Um, I got these three finishes. Um, I'm pretty sure this material is, is vinyl. Some people think it's mylar, but I don't think it is, because it is stretchy a bit. Just doesn't feel like a mylar balloon, for example. Anyway, this was expensive. This is about 60 bucks worth of this stuff off of Amazon. So what kind of results do I have? Uh, it's interesting. Um, I've been uh, applying it to one of my little mule things. And when you just lay it down, I, I, it's, I don't know what it is with this stuff and the texture. But if you look at this piece, Okay, maybe, I don't know if this is gonna really show up. If you look at this piece right here, you can see very clearly the orange peel texture. It's not there when it's still on the backing film, as you can see right here. I mean, that is about as mirror finish as you're gonna get. So I don't know what the deal is, but I've been experimenting with it and it does some interesting stuff. Uh, the first thing I noticed was that it does not conform I, I mean, if you just put it on with nothing else, it doesn't conform. And you can see that right there, that it's not conformed to the rivets. Um, but it, it is pretty durable, and you can kind of polish it and do some interesting things with it. Like this stuff that's the titanium finish is a little too dull for what I want, whereas the other was is a little too shiny. But I found that I could take a polishing stick like this and kind of work on it. And I don't know, you know, exactly what this finish is, but it kind of starts to rub off and it gets selectively a little bit uh, shinier, a little more polished looking. So I, I think it's got some potential. You can kind of see what I'm talking about there. But here's the thing, is getting to, getting the, the I mean, it's useless to me for anything other than a perfectly smooth panel if I can't get the features to show up from underneath. So I did some experimenting. One thing I did was I hit it with a hairdryer to see if it would shrink up. 
And it's interesting because a lot of the texture went away on that, <laughs> but <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I had the hair dryer set on full hot, holding it real close, and you can see what happened. That is definitely not a result you want. But here's what's interesting is that, all, that it did not settle down, it puffed up, which kind of makes sense because you got a tiny little volume of hot air trapped in each one of those uh, rivet depressions and it just blows up like a tiny little balloon. So that's sort of cool, I don't know. You know, it's better than no features for sure. Uh, but what I really want is to get it into the panel lines. So I started experimenting with decal setting solutions. Solve a set on top does nothing. Um, went a little bit stronger, got out some Tamiya lacquer thinner, and on top, one application really doesn't do much. A second application, heavier, you can see it starts to kind of craze the material there in that lower left-hand corner, you can see that. But what definitely I, I figured out is that if you can get that Tamiya lacquer thinner underneath it, it will start to suck it down into the panel lines. And so, I took a piece and I just brushed some Tamiya lacquer thinner on the surface and then stuck this thing right on over the top of it. And yeah, it sticks on there immediately and you cannot have any bubbles. Um, it softens the material and if you're not careful, you'll get some wrinkles. That's what happened on this sample. You can see those wavy lines. Um, but here's the important thing. Look how much it pulls down into those features. That right there, obviously, is what I want. I wanted to do that on all the features. Uh, but it seems like there's a like a real narrow window of opportunity between softens enough to perfectly uh, show the features and becomes so soft that it gets screwed up. Because you can see there's a wrinkle kind of a thing going through it right there. It's not as easy to see on camera as it is in real life, but it is definitely gone uh, prune shaped right there along that sort of line. And you can see that that's what happened here. So I don't know, I'm gonna continue to tinker with this stuff because I think that there's some potential. It may only be in certain situations, but we'll see. If you're wondering what this is, that is some of Tom Annie's uh, chrome decal stuff. Couldn't resist trying that. And he, you know, he had already told us that it wasn't gonna work uh, with decal setting solution. And that is exactly the case. This was, I think, uh, solve a set and you can see, turned it totally prune shaped and it never recovered. So that's just not gonna be an option uh, for that type of thing. It's a bummer because uh, his decal film looks really good and um, I'd like to be able to use it, but whatever. Anyway, this is a piece of that titanium film and you can see where I've kind of uh, polished off a little bit of the coating. And so you get that sort of, I mean, look, that's really realistic right there. If I could just figure out how to transfer this to the surface and maintain all of its good qualities. But you know, that's been basically the story of every one of these methods that I've been tinkering with. Here's the other super cool thing I got on my bench. Yes. The guys at AFV Modeler, David Parker and Mark Neville, have uh, turned on the publishing machine again and have re-released Adam's Armor 1 and 2. And uh, you know, obviously by Adam Wilder. I don't know a damn thing about tanks or building tanks, but maybe I will after I look at these books. I literally have not even opened them yet. I, I got them a couple of weeks ago and they just kind of sat on my bench. And I really actually only opened the box uh, yesterday. But obviously uh, they're gonna be good because they're, you know, everything Adam does is super cool. So this is, I'm looking forward to getting into these books. Hopefully they will, yeah, I will not, uh, you know, they will not get uh, abandoned to the pile of super cool books that I still haven't read yet, but. Um, these are neat. So anyway, there's that and that's enough random for today.